Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm. Thank you for coming. Thanks for coming out this morning. I'm Blair, the director of the Puppet Festival. We are in our penultimate day of our festival, <coughs> beginning Saturday morning. Um, so uh, uh, I'm feeling a little. <coughs> my voice is lower, as you can tell. Um, and uh, two of our panelists are making their way upstairs now. So, but we want to go ahead and begin. Uh, and uh, so, um, uh, just to say, uh, th we have one more uh, book talk that happens today, um, and uh, that one's at at four thirty, four thirty in this room. So uh, that'll be our fourth one. So uh, if you're interested in this kind of thing, um, as well as just to plug that tomorrow we have our the final performance is Yael Razuli. Uh, doing a, a, an evening of, of song with her puppet of uh, Edith Piaf, and it's happening uh, up north at the Rhapsody Theater. It's a beautiful little cabaret space, so it's going to be a really special night. So um, if, you're, if you're up for that kind of thing, I think it's going to be uh, pretty entertaining. Um, so without further ado, I, I'm going to turn this over to Paulette Richards. Thank you. Hey, greetings. Thank you all for dragging yourselves out of bed on Saturday morning in the second weekend of the festival. Um, we are happy to welcome Tita Jacobelli and Natasha Belova this morning. And we also have the wonderful translation skills of Ana Diaz Bariga, who is a um, st graduate student at Northwestern University and one of our very talented reviewers of shows for the festival. So we're going to start with um, the people at hand and the, our other panelists will join us um, when they get here. So <laughs> the theme of our symposium series this year, as you may know, is the materiality of the puppet. And I had four nice alliterative titles for the panel sessions, materials, mechanisms, manipulation, and then I was also interested in construction <coughs> techniques. And I thought it would be really cool to have Basil Twist on that panel because he is such a genius at construction techniques and design. However, when it got posted to the website, this panel was named Manipulation. So we are going to do a mixture of both today. Since we have um, Jacobelli Belova company here first, uh, what I'll do is introduce them, and then they have some slides from various shows um, that they will talk about. And then we'll see if the other panelists have filtered in, and if not, we will just riff. So thank you for your patience. Let me um, introduce the panelists that we do have here, and then we'll get started. Thank you. All right, I gotta squint at this. But I'll start with Natasha Belova, who is here in the green. She was born in Russia and graduated in history and has lived in Belgium since 1995. After initial work as a costume and set designer on the Belgian and international performing arts circuits, she went on to specialize in contemporary puppetry circus, cinema, and opera. She acquired a great deal of experience that drove her to instigate her own projects. Her first creations came in the form of exhibitions and installations. Yay, Yay. welcome, Yaul. <laughs> Yael, she made it. Yay, please have a seat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there you are. Good morning. Hi. Hi. Okay. So um, in November of 2017, she realized her first work as a stage designer with Compagnie La Barca de Matis Passageria at IF Festival, Internazionale di Teatro di Imagines a figura in Milan. And I hope I didn't butcher that too badly. Spanish I have a bit, Italian not at all. So um, 
Italy, okay, in recent years, she has given numerous puppet workshops in 15 countries across three continents, and in 2016 founded her own Center for Research and Training, the IFO, a nonprofit based in Brussels. And this is a good moment. Um, I don't know if the workshop that you all are teaching after the festival is mm -hmm. full or not yet, but you might want to inquire. And if you would like to spend a week learning their marvelous technique, um, that would be, I think, a really fun time. I so did the workshop, one of the best decisions of my life. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, and so then um, the partner, Tita Jacobelli, whom we saw last night in um, Chaika. Yes. <laughs> began her career as an artist in 2001. In 2003, she won the Best Actress Award at the Nuevos Directores Festival, and since 2005, she has worked as an actress and puppeteer, as well as co-directing several works by Jaime um, Lorca's Viaje na... Sorry. Gracias. Okay, yeah, um, it's small here. <laughs> okay, company. So she also gives puppetry workshops. Her work uh, um, on various stages in Europe and the Americas has included productions such as Gulliver, 2006, and Othello, 2012. Her close ties to music led her to direct several musicals with youth company, youth theater company, Teatro de Ocasión and theatrical concerts with the Chilean Jazz Fusion Ensemble Congreso and the Philharmonic Orchestra of the Santiago Municipal Theater. So please welcome our first two panelists. Thunderously. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and I think what I'll do, oh, here he comes. No, no, no. <laughs> Sorry, I thought it was him. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so I think what I'll do, since um, I have media for them, is let them have 15 minutes or so to speak about their work, and then the background, I'll be pulling up what I need to properly introduce Yael, and hopefully Basil will arrive in the interim. So let me take this down for the moment and put up, uh, I'm in Basil's thing and I need to be in the other one. Okay. Okay. Alors vous avez mis trois fichiers, lequel voulez-vous commencer? Je n'ai aujourd'hui encore un fichier sur ma table? Non, je n'ai pas. Thermomousse est mixte. Parce que... Ça, c'est fichier plus technique. OK. Euh, L'autre jour, vous m'avez envoyé aussi. Oui, mais non, mais... Euh, c'était... C'était ça Non, ça, c'est autre personne. Euh, oui, c'est... C'est ça Mais c'est déjà parler de construction très concrète. Oh c'est pas pour parler de compagnie. Donc, j'ai mmh. mis des fichiers très techniques sur la construction. Oui, mais n'importe. 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 OK. <rire> On va à l'improviste. So, sorry, we're, we're in the, um, we, we didn't get all the media files together, but we're going to work with what we have. Mm -hmm. And as I said, this fest, I had envisioned this panel as the construction panel, and Natasha is the construction expert. So we are going to dip into construction, but we will try very hard to link how construction relates to manipulation. Thank you. So, <laughs> is this... Okay. Okay. Oh, français, alors. Ça va en oui, ça va en français. Ouais. Donc, <laughs> we are an international festival. Moi, j'ai travaillé plus dans les constructions avant de, de marionnettes, avant de travailler avec Tita en mise en scène de Chaika et Loco, nos spectacles de marionnettes. Et donc, euh, pendant les travail pour beaucoup de compagnies, j'ai développé deux techniques principales que j'utilise maintenant. Euh, 
Okay. You take. <laughs> no, uh, je parle français. Yeah, okay. yeah. Oh, she, okay. she worked she worked with some companies before working with Tita mm -hmm. in um, in Loco and Chaika, which are the, the shows that they've created together, and you develop two construction techniques. Mais euh, peut-être avant de parler des choses très concrètes en technique de construction, peut-être on peut parler des questions que tu nous as posées. Euh, oui, ça va bien. Une question qu'on se pose avant de commencer à construire. Bon. Comme ça, après, je vais aussi développer. Okay. Euh, ça si va tu bien. veux, je, je peux okay. commencer par ça. Great. So she's asking if we can start with the questions that I sent in advance. Um, and I sent those to, I meant those for the whole panel, but um, so you'll hear them repeated. The first one, what did the puppet need to do? What did the puppet need to do? Uh, ça me permettrait aussi uh, uh, commencer à, um, à expliquer pourquoi je fais uh, de cette ou l'autre façon, mm -hmm. tu vois? Yeah. That allows her to like figure out why she does things one way rather than another. Donc, uh, quand j'ai commencé à travailler dans le théâtre des marionnettes, je sortais de théâtre uh, dramatique où on a travaillé avec des comédiens vivants, pas des figures construites à l'image humaine. She comes from working uh, in a theater of actors, so she didn't have to build the actors. <laughs> <laughs> Et le euh, premier spectacle que j'ai fait après la pièce de Alejandro Khodorovsky euh, parlait euh, d'une école de ventriloque où euh, les élèves construisaient leurs marionnettes à partir de leurs pulsions euh, les plus cachées dans leur corps. So the first piece she worked on was a piece based on Alejandro Khodorovsky where they were like in a school of ventriloquists and the, the actors had to build their, well, their dummies based on their kind of like hidden passions, Le forces, the darkest, their darkest secrets. And that was my first spectacle where I construisais des marionnettes. Et personne dans la compagnie euh, savait ce que c'est les marionnettes, personne n'avait manipulé les marionnettes, ni metteur en scène, ni moi, ni comédien. That was the first show that she built puppets for, and no one in the company had manipulated neither the actor nor the director. No one had used puppets before. Et on avait déjà, je pense, 12 personnages à créer. Uh, il avait 12, 12 marionnettes de taille humaine. There were 12, 12. puppets, uh, human-sized puppets. Et, uh, et je pense que c'est là de... de de situation impossible est venue les techniques que j'ai développées, je pense. Cette situation était tellement impossible que j'ai dû développer une, euh, une technique qui correspond à cette euh, situation. She had to develop her technique based on this impossible situation. <laughs> Et donc, euh, je faisais beaucoup de photos des comédiens. Qui sont... so she took photos of all the actors. Yeah. Je les imprimé sur les tissus. Just printed them on paper. On, on no, fabric. Sorry. On, on fabric. fabric yeah. Sorry. <laughs> J'ai sculpté en mousse de parce qu'on avait des mousses dans notre théâtre, des mousses de lit. Tu vois, mousse, ça forme. Yeah. Foam. Foam. Oh, foam. She sculpted the foam. Et j'ai habillé avec la peau des comédiens que j'ai transformé les marionnettes. And she dressed up the foam with the with the skin of the actors that she had created. Donc c'était une forme de Frankenstein. Euh, ouais. <laughs> et c'est venu parce que je ne savais pas <coughs> comment faire et j'ai pensé de façon très, euh, très, euh, comment dire, primitive, comment faire des, des marionnettes. Et donc de là naît cette première forme que j'utilise, les marionnettes en mousse avec la bouche articulée, parce qu'il fallait qu'ils parlent aussi. So she came up with this idea because She, like it was kind of like a primitive way of dealing with the challenge that she had at hand and it was a puppet that had an articulated mouth because these puppets needed to speak. Et je pensais que j'avante un style mais en fait c'est un style qui existe, il y a des marionnettes taille humaine. Euh, 
mais ce qu'il fallait pour notre compagnie, que comédiens soient très présents, leur corps doit être dans marionnette, parce que ce n'étaient pas des marionnettistes, ils ne pouvaient pas avoir les techniques des marionnettistes, donc il fallait que ces marionnettes soient en partie avec eux, donc fusionnées avec leur corps. Uh, these puppets needed to be like they she thought that she had a style of her own but but it's a style that exists which is the the human sized puppets and these actors needed to be very present on stage because they didn't have the technique of a puppeteer so their bodies were used as part of the puppets et, euh, et là je vais montrer un peu le, le, le technique comme ça vous voyez de quoi je parle et ça tu peux voir pas celle là mais celle qui mousse c'est ah oui C'est le résultat. Attends, ça c'est le final. Uh, uh, reviens, le deuxième. Tout est l'envers, je crois. Et la première. Donc ça c'est la sculpture en mousse dans laquelle il y a l'endroit pour les mains. So this is the foam sculpture that has the space for the hand. Tu peux revenir. Ça c'est les photos. With the, with the printed photos of the actors starting to come on top of the... Et puis le final. Ouais. Et donc ça parle. Mais, euh, comment dire, euh, ce qu'il fallait dans ce spectacle, qu'il y a ressemblance avec les comédiens, mais qu'il y a quelque chose de très monstrueux. They needed for this show that the puppets resemble the actors, but they needed to look a little bit uh, grotesque. Et il fallait que comédien avec leur mouvement de main, quand il articule, il le sent euh, de façon organique, comme uh, un humain ou un comédien qui n'a pas habitude peut le faire. They needed the puppets to to be able to be manipulated very organically with the hand of the of the actors who didn't have this experience of manipulating puppets. Et puis euh, ça c'est les techniques que j'ai beaucoup utilisées. Uh, et deuxième technique que j'utilise maintenant plus, c'est la technique de Warbla et thermoplastique. Vous connaissez ici probablement, non? Ah, uh, so this is the first technique that she uses, and the second one uses thermoplastic and Warbla. 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 Yeah. <laughs> et uh, dans cette technique, la bouche de marionnette ne s'ouvre pas, mais le mouvement uh, de, de tête il permet d'avoir impression de, de voix. C'est ce que vous avez vu dans Chaika. So these puppets, they don't move their mouth, but the expression of the face uh, gives like this sensation of, of movement, as you have seen in Chaika. Mais ça, c'est une uh, autre marionnette, mais vous voyez tous les étapes de construction. This is a different puppet, but you can see the stages of construction. Et donc, euh, euh, pour euh, répondre au cours, et après je laisse euh, Tita, à la question que maintenant, après 15 ans, je peux me poser de façon plus consciente avec l'expérience, qu'est-ce que doit faire les marionnettes, en tout cas quand je les construis, et qu'est-ce que j'ai envie qu'elles là The question that she is asking herself after 15 years of, of building puppets like this, and that drives how she builds puppets. Malgré que mes marionnettes sont très fort li euh, liées à une morphologie très humain, et sont la même taille humain, ils sont assez réalistes. Ce que je cherche dans marionnettes, c'est qu'il y a quand même un espace où euh, il est imparfait. So she builds these puppets that look kind of human and they are human size, uh, but she's like looking for a space where they are imperfect. Qu'il y a uh, quelque chose qui n'est pas figé dans une expression trop forte. There's something that's not fixed and they have a, a like a strong expression. Qu'il permet de transformer des, des émotions que le spectateur projette, cette marionnette. So that um, they allow the spectator to transform the emotions that they're projecting onto the puppet. Et que, um, 
le, le marionnette soit sur la projection en fait des émotions que euh, l'histoire vous raconte donc c'est le spectateur qui se raconte plus d'histoires avec marionnettes que le marionnette les raconte il faut qu'elle soit une ça va <rire> comme une panel de, de projection so the puppet becomes like a panel that you can project on so the puppet is telling you a story but the spectator is projecting a lot of a lot more story from from what they're getting from the puppet Uh, pour dire, par exemple, très uh, concrètement, nous avons deux spectacles, une avec les techniques de Tchaïka que peut-être vous avez vu, avec une marionnette qui n'ouvre pas la bouche, et pourtant il parle beaucoup, <rire> et c'était assez logique, on, se, on voit maintenant qu'elle n'ouvre pas la bouche parce que c'est quelque part se passe dans sa tête. Et c'est nous qui projette son histoire. So they have another show that is done in the same style as Chaika, where the where the puppet is supposed to speak a lot, but this puppet doesn't move his mouth, and so it works really well. Oh, it is Chaika. So in Chaika, the puppet doesn't move the mouth, but it is speaking a lot. But it makes sense because it's the the projection of what's going on in their mind. Et loco où il parle moins. L'autre spectacle qui on a fait le dernier où le personnage parle beaucoup, ça parle moins, et il y a sept pages de moins de texte, il ouvre la bouche. And in their other show, Loco, the, the character speaks less, but that puppet can open its mouth. Parce que quelque part, même quand il ouvre la bouche, ça ne correspond pas toujours à ce qu'il dit. Donc les ouvertures et expressions de la bouche euh, brouillent la compréhension plus que le comprendre. Tu vois ce que je veux dire euh, euh, Brouiller, comment, comment expliquer ça que, euh, comme brouiller, comme Comment Non, que, euh, que quiero decir que quand euh, il habla, il habla tan malo que alguna vez la, la forme de hablar no ayuda a comprensión, pero ayuda a entender que está loco. So the way he speaks is like uh, nonsensical or not correct. So sometimes the way he speaks is not actually reflecting what he's thinking, but it reflects that he's crazy. Et ça c'est le personnage de Loco. Et on peut commencer au début comme ça vous voyez le. Et donc ça c'est un personnage qui est justement avec ces deux techniques que je montrais avant sont mixées ensemble. Il y a des thermoplastiques qui permet finition plus forte et mousse qui permet avoir la bouche articulée. So this puppet combines both techniques donc, um, allowing for the strong expression but also the movement of the mouth. Et ça, c'est la photo de, de spectacle. Je laisse le, les paroles parce que je veux gérer. OK. Just let me have a, a moment here. Uh, there's a few people standing in the back, and there's still some seats, empty seats up front. So feel free to come and have a seat if you would like. OK, thank you. OK, is this good? So, You gave a very comprehensive and fascinating answer to that first question. And in the midst of answering that first question, <coughs> you also answered the question of how the design evolved. And um, in a way, the advantages of the chosen material, that is the warbler, warbler um, thermoplastic versus the foam, in, and I suppose it's a latex skin, Over the phone? No. no. What is it? Uh, I use uh, the uh, fabric. Fabric, okay. Oh, paper. Or paper, okay. So we had two different materials that provided two different capabilities for manipulation. And what I'd like to do now is pose the manipulation question mm -hmm. that I sent you all to Tita. So, um, How did your manipulation techniques evolve in negotiation with the materials okay. and mechanisms of the puppet? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to speak in Spanish, okay? 
Cuando pensamos con Natalia cómo hacer, por ejemplo, Chaika, hablamos de la idea de, de la dualidad que existe en la gaviota de Chejo. So when they were developing Chaika, they were speaking about the duality that exists in, in um, Chekhov's seagull. Y, y Natalia tomó u, el molde de mi cara para hacer a Chaika. And Natasha took the mold of her face to create Chaika. Y ella llegó un día con la a Chile uh, con la Chaika con la marioneta de Chaika, la cabeza de Chaika eh, lista. And she arrived in Chile one day with the with the puppet's head ready. Y fue una impresión muy grande para mí. Eh, yo sentí mucho miedo. It was very shocking and very scary. <laughs> Porque vi eh, mi madre, mi abuela, <laughs> mi vieja. Because she could see her mother, her grandma, herself as an old woman. Y dije, tuve miedo y re, inmediatamente se creó una tensión porque yo me dije, no, no quiero hablar de mí. And that created tension because she didn't want to speak about herself. Pero siempre hablas de ti. Eh, sobre todo con las marionetas, tú hablas de ti. But you're always speaking about yourself, especially with puppetry. La marioneta eres tú. You're the puppet. <laughs> y, y yo tenía una idea muy fija en mi cabeza al principio eh, que yo iba como personaje detrás manipulando a la, a mar, a la marioneta, iba a um, provocarla. Eh, en una manera un poco malvada. So she had this idea at the beginning that she was going to be manipulating the puppet and kind of like provoking it in like a kind of mean way. Pero tú nunca puedes pensar algo antes. Siempre la marioneta va a hacer lo que ella quiera. But you can never plan ahead. The puppet is always going to do whatever the puppet wants to do. Lo que hice entonces fue... Eh, eh, desarrollar la personalidad de esta marioneta. So she developed the personality of the puppet. Y encontrarle una voz eh, para que ella fuera buscando su camino, encontrando su camino y mostrándomelo. And find the puppet's voice so that the puppet could find her own way and show, show it to her. Cuando en cuando desarrollas mucho eh, la personalidad y los movimientos de una marioneta, la gestualidad, es decir, eh, construyes el abecedario de la marioneta y vas eh, juntando letras y haciendo palabras y luego frases, todo eso en un lenguaje gestual. ¿Se entiende? Yeah, so you develop the, if you start developing the personality and the gestures of a puppet, you're kind of like generating a vocabulary, you're learning the alphabet of the puppet and then being able to build words and build sentences through the gestures. Mm -hmm. eh, luego puedes eh, liberarte un poco de la técnica y hacer que la marioneta reaccione con eh, el texto y la acción de la obra que estamos trabajando, en este caso de Sigo. So then you can, after you do that, you can release the technique a little bit and you can let yourself and the puppet respond more to the text of the play or the actions of the play. Y en ese momento, la pregunta es, eh, no qué voy a hacer con la marioneta, sino qué va a hacer esta marioneta conmigo. And then the question becomes not, what am I going to do with this puppet, but what is this puppet going to do with me? Y ahí cambió eh, mi rol en la obra. Y lo que yo había pensado que iba a ser eh, se transformó completamente en lo contrario. Yo fui una asistente, alguien que ayuda al personaje de Chaika a pasar a través de esta de esta obra. And then what whatever initial ideas she had flipped completely and she became an assistant of the puppet and helping the puppet get through this play performance. Mm -hmm. eh... Eso. Great. Thank you. So um, I'm going to take the opportunity to ask one question.
that came up in the van as the catapult participants were riding to the next performance after seeing your phenomenal performance last night. Um, so the puppet here in Chaika, we were wondering, is it really a puppet or is it more of a mask? Because there's the head part um, that's a separate piece. And then you're wearing a costume that um, in a way you are inside the puppet performing rather than the puppet being more distanced from your body. Eh, bueno, es esta técnica híbrida que Natalia y yo desarrollamos eh, tiene que ver con eh, eh, interrogarnos como, como personas todo el tiempo. Entonces, no es un títere separado a, a, a la actriz, es, es la misma persona que se divide en esta dualidad de la que hablaba. So th through this hybrid technique that they develop, they're always like questioning who they are as people. <coughs> and the idea is that this puppet is not a puppet that exists separate from the actor, but rather the actor and the puppet are part of a duality. Y todas las temáticas que tratan, que, que nosotras tomamos de la obra de, de Chekhov, eh, las desarrollamos a través de esta, esta imagen doble. And all the themes that they took from Chekhov's play are developed through this dual image. Uh, so, yes, it is a mask, and it's also a, a puppet, but uh, it's, it's the two things uh, at the same time. Um, uh, we wanted to talk about many things, uh, like uh, solitude, uh, lo loneliness, and of course, in you can, hay muchas capas en la, en la obra que tú puedes uh, reflexionar sobre. There's many layers in the performance that you can reflect on. Pero la, quizás la más primitiva es una persona jugando con un títere que no existe. Es una persona sola. But the most kind of like basic one is that it's a person playing with a puppet. So it's a person that is alone. Bueno, durante todo el show la cara de la marioneta está delante mío. Entonces, sí. During the whole show the face of the puppet is in front of her own face. Y en este caso es un poco eh, una interpretación que hacemos del personaje de Nina en The Seagull, que oh, más bien de, de Arcadina, eh, de la vieja actriz de The Seagull. This is an interpretation of Arcadina, eh, the old actor in and, Seagull. And Nina. And Nina. Y el temor, el terrible temor que siente Arcadina de que esta nueva generación tome su lugar. And the deep fear that Arcadina fear, feels about the new generation taking her place. Uh, me, pero en, uh, en periodo de trabajo usamos también la títeres como máscara. Usamos y probamos mucha cosa, pero nada funcionó porque cuando se, se dispara ese tita, se disparece el centro, yo pienso, de trabajo que hacemos. Esto doble tiene que existir. Para esto yo pienso, no es máscara, es, mm. es otra identidad. 
So when they were workshopping the show, they played a lot with many ideas, including having it as a mask that would cover a Tita's face. But when Tita disappears, they kind of like <laughs> lose the center of the issues that they're trying to explore in terms of the duality. Well, thank you, and I hope that cleared up some of the discussion in the catapult as well. That was, thank you, thank you. Um, we're gonna do this. We're gonna turn to the next panelist, and I hope that Basil may be ready. Sure. Okay, good. So he did send me some things. Um, Sorry. <laughs> while I'm fumbling, while I'm fumbling, perhaps there's one burning question from the floor. Anyone? Mm -hmm. No? Yeah, okay, Jackie, go ahead. Um, uh, wait, wait, wait. You get the mic. <laughs> Can you both, I know you kind of mentioned it a little bit, but what exactly are the materials that you use? And do you use any non-toxic materials for people like me who can't use toxic materials? Okay. Uh, qui est une résine euh, thermomodulable. Euh, moi, en Belgique, j'ai rencontré les gens qui vendent ce matériel. Vous pouvez trouver sur la site de Warbla expli explication sur, le, sur toutes les qualités euh, euh, chimiques de ce produit et aussi euh, il y a un certificat de non-toxicité qu'on s'est utilisé dans l'espace grand et qu'il ne faut pas porter le masque. Ça, c'est l'information que j'ai eue par le producteur de ce produit que je rencontrais. So she uses Warblack, which is a thermodynamic resin. Uh, if you go to the website, they give you all the information about the chemical components of it. Uh, she found the people who sell it in Belgium and talked to them. And they like gave them gave her a certificate of like everything that it has and how to use it safely in a big space and using a mask. C'est ce que je, moi j'ai comme information. Donc après je suis pas chimiste. Donc nous on essaye toujours. Uh, the website has all the chemical specifications. She is not a <laughs> chemist, so all she knows is from this information. Et, uh, avant, quand j'étais très jeune, je travaillais avec beaucoup de produits euh, pas bonnes. <rire> je ne mettais pas le masque. Euh, à partir de certains âges, j'essaie toujours de vérifier qu'il n'y a pas de danger. Donc, je n'aime pas du tout travailler avec des produits qui, euh, qui peuvent être dangereux pour moi ou pour les élèves. Donc, je, je suis très prudente là-dessus. So, when she was young, she used to use more dangerous products and then after and she wouldn't wear a mask etc so after a certain age she started being more mindful of those things and now she is really careful of using products that are non-toxic and won't harm her or her students et c'est un produit qui était fait pour les gens qui utilisent dans cosplay dans le jeu de, euh, jeu de rôle et dans l'usage privé donc c'est pas un produit avant j'ai utilisé celle qu'on utilisait dans l'usine mais là c'est fait pour les gens qui travaillent à la maison Donc, c'est pas un produit euh, industriel. So this product is not an industrial product. It's a product that is created mainly for people that do cosplay for them to use privately at home. Right. Thank you so much. Okay, I finally have pulled up uh, Basil's bio, and I will introduce him properly. <coughs> and then I have his images already, so we're yeah. good to go. So, a third generation performer Twist was born in Chicago and is a third generation puppeteer. Twist has garnered an international reputation as a puppeteer, designer, director, and creator. He is a sought after collaborator for theater, ballet, opera, dance, and film. His unique approaches and techniques have been 
recognized with multiple awards, fellowships, critical acclaim, and have furthered contemporary artistry and the technical craft of puppetry. Basil is known for revitalizing puppetry as a serious and sophisticated art form through his imaginative experiments with materials, yay, techniques, mm -hmm. yay, that's what we're talking about, and uses in both narrative and abstract works. Basil's shows range from productions of classic stories to abstract visualizations of orchestral music and are informed by puppetry traditions from around the world. Basil received a degree from the École Nationale Supérieure des Arts de la Marionnette in Charleville-Mézières, France, where he was trained uh, in set design, costume design, doc, uh, dramaturgy, music, and art acting. Thank you. Original works include Symphonie Fantastique from 1998, which featured abstract materials in a tank of water to simulate imagery and characters to music. He contributed to the magic of Alfonso Cuarón's Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Didn't know that, cool. Creating the Dementors. <laughs> Highlights of his original shows include Petrushka, Dogu Gaeshi, Rite of Spring, Hansel and Gretel, Arias with a Twist, La Bella Dormente Nel Bosco, and Sister Follies. Please welcome Basil Twist. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I had, um, I think that uh, Natasha gave us a good opening by um, taking up the question that I had sent to the panelists, so I'll ask you, okay. and then I'll open your slides and hopefully you can link it to the question. So okay. the question is, what did the puppet need to do? <laughs> um, so I, the, the pictures that I sent you are for the show that is part of this year's festival, which is Book of Mountains and Seas. And, uh, and in th this puppet that, that you can see here, um, it's interesting. <laughs> it was a journey. So um, the puppet originally, the show had a very interesting um, genesis. Um, it's being presented here as part of the, also besides the Chicago um, International Festival of Puppet Theater, but it's also part of the Chicago Opera Theater season. So um, it has uh, 12 really extraordinary singers on stage, and the piece was a was really created for those singers. It's a group called Ars Nova based out of Copenhagen. And originally, um, the original invitation for the show was to have the singers be puppeteers. And I thought, no way, that will never work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I went and I, but I was invited to go and meet this group of singers anyway. And, uh, and, uh, I did meet them. This was in 2018, and um, and they were actually pretty game for the process. And um, at the time, so the the piece was being written. So the composer is a, the first time I'd worked with a living composer named Wang Ro. Um, the composer had not yet written the piece. He'd written snippets of it. But he had some concepts of the stories, which were these based on um, Chinese uh, creation myths, and um, and so one of one of the stories in particular, the is the story of uh, of a giant who's chasing the sun, and I did what I always do in every process. I started working with cardboard and um, and I like silk a lot, so I like. Cardboard and this sort of a hard element, and silk is a um, the soft element, and and tape and scissors, and I'll cut stuff together and put it apart, and you can make, I think, almost anything out of that, um, is as just as the initial process, and so I did that with the singers, um, and uh, and we made this cardboard giant that they. <coughs> puppeteered and, uh, and, and, and sung 
with, actually. They, they, they sung things that they had already um, knew and memorized, um, and they actually puppeteered <laughs> this giant and the, um, the, the, uh, the aspects of the giant. I remember, we, you know, you build a thing in a workshop and it's not extremely well built, and um, it, <laughs> it started to fall apart. <laughs> In, in the workshop, and, and it was, we realized it was extremely moving. <laughs> that, that this big figure, that everyone was excited by working this big figure and having him move, and he's chasing, kind of running after um, uh, the, the sun, which we represented with a, with a paper lantern. And, um, and he would fall apart. <laughs> and we thought it was really beautiful as he fell apart. And it, that was sort of, that was the workshop. And I, and I um, we did other, there are four different stories which have different aspects um, in them. But just to speak about this, this giant in particular, because he's kind of the most interesting and he's the most, uh, he's the most figurative of a puppet within the show. Um, so, so I left that experience thinking, well, I guess they can do it. They're kind of, <laughs> They're sort of game. Oh, all right, I'll I'll make this show for these singers, and um, and all of the stories were. It had to be very obviously pared down and slim what they were doing, so that they could focus on their singing because that's really their their main thing. Um, fast forward into the pandemic, etc. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing at all, but it, well, it, it actually it didn't really matter. It was about the piece being written. Once the piece was actually written, as the piece got finally written, um, it's an extremely complicated piece of music for even the most experienced singers to sing. And then they <laughs> came back to me and said, Basil, we can't memorize this music. We won't be able to memorize it. We're going to need to hold sheet music in our hands. Um, <laughs> And I thought, well, this, that, I, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> this will never work. So, so, uh, so, so I brought in puppeteers. I brought in a team of my puppeteers from New York, and, um, and they joined the troupe, and that was a challenge to the producers. But, um, but uh, eventually, we, we, we made the show. But the, 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 the genesis of how the giant was was that the giants was, was meant to be he was going to be actually, in, in a way also that we s saw in the workshop, that he actually gets assembled on stage and falls apart on stage. And that, um, and that, and, and goes through some very simple space, uh, paces that accompany the music. So um, anyway, that's sort of just a funny anecdote about the singers <laughs> doing <laughs> it. Ultimately, then, then we had the next problem was with the puppeteers. Okay, the puppeteers are gonna do this. So I did a workshop with the puppeteers with the cardboard, again using cardboard. We kept kind of re rebuilt the giant several times and, and made the, um, you know, eventually kind of figured out how he should be, like what parts of him. The, the idea then got clear about the, the piece. So I was using silk and paper lanterns. And instead of cardboard, I decided I wanted it to be a very raw material, organic looking material, so I wanted to use something like driftwood, which is what this, um, this figure eventually is meant to look like. Um, and we built him out of cardboard and the puppeteers would work him and we had a great plan for him. He was gonna be worked as a rod puppet because um, the spaces that we were gonna be in were often um, uh, concert halls where there there were there was no real theatrical, um, it, you know, it wasn't equipped as a theater. It was just a concert hall. So we had to kind of make it be very simple. And we had these pieces that started as cardboard that eventually became driftwood. And I can say more about what the driftwood was made of because <laughs> I know people are always curious about that. The, 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 the driftwood pieces are, are, um, are made out of uh, 
they have sort of PVC tubing inside of them, which is like a bone, and then they have clips attached to the ends of the PVC tubing so that, that they can clip together and, and be reconfigured into different shapes. And then that is built out with, indeed, with cardboard, so that's uh, given a bulk, and then the skin of it is covered with um, uh, a not, uh, <laughs> a not healthy material, which is a, um, which is uh, we use uh, polystyrene um, uh, batting um, that we, you would find kind of inside of a quilt or something, and then we and then we destroy it with a heat gun, um, so uh, that it twists and curdles and has this fantastic organic quality, but it is really um, a stinky, toxic <laughs> process. And, and then, um, and then w we cover that with a lightweight resin to fix it. In the end, though, what happened, though, is that this is a constant problem for myself, and I'm sure for everybody on this panel and <laughs> in the puppetry world, is that you start with an idea, you make something, and as you start to go, it gets heavier. <laughs> and, it, and, and things get heavier. It just happens, you know? It's like you all, and I n knew, of course, this, it, you always know it's gonna happen. You try to plan <coughs> in for it. The thing is, these, these, this figure got heavier. We tried to work him on sticks, like a big parade pageant puppet, and he, it was too heavy. I have like one, you know, really strong puppeteer, and I was like, he'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when I couldn't do it, I knew that it was not feasible and, and dangerous to do. So we had to make a big change in the middle of all the craziness and the changes that kept were coming down the line, mm -hmm. which was that this puppet would need to be suspended um, from ropes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it you know, changes significantly what kind of spaces you can be in. Um, but pretty much any space, you can figure out some way to put a pulley and hang a rope. So, um, so now, so the puppet became a giant marionette over the course of its uh, of its life. And uh, it's if you see the show, it's it's really I think really moving when the puppet is um, actually assembled before our eyes, and the singers help with that. The singers help assemble the puppet, um, and then the puppet gets hooked up. And, and comes to life and, and has kind of his life cycle on stage running after a paper lantern, which re represents the sun, and over the course of the show, he falls apart. <laughs> um, and it's very, it's beautiful, but that's what the initial, how it started was with a junky cardboard <laughs> prototype um, and just keeping all those ideas intact, even him falling apart. That's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So in your story, you covered all of the four questions that I <laughs> sent out. But did you want to say anything about the other images that you sent me? Sure. I mean, okay. I just this is just that that's this is another picture of Kwafu, the giant, um, and. Uh, and when he starts uh, laying down, and that's my team of super duper puppeteers behind him, um, getting him ready. Um, this is a this is a picture of um, you can see the singers, <coughs> the the Ars Nova singers, um, and uh, uh, amazingly, so they needed to surprise. They needed to hold their sheet music in front of them. And I, th uh, I thought, God, how are we going to do this? How are they going to, are there going to be all these papers falling all over the stage? And, you know, um, they use iPads to read the music. And it actually has this really wonderful side effect, too, mm -hmm. that it lights their faces. Mm -hmm. So it creates this sort of, there are these glowing faces in the dark. Um, that comes from this, <laughs> this, this horrible dilemma that showed up that they needed to read their music. They have it on an iPad, and the iPad lights their faces, and you can see that here. Um, also, there's a big uh, piece of silk, so we use silk um, as exactly as we did in the workshop. Um, I have a lot of silk in my arsenal. I just brought it with me. Um, uh, eventually, we got a specific piece of silk made for this um, show, but the silk uh, represents, as it often does, it represents uh, water, um, and this is a scene where 
they go under the water. So the silk gets lifted up over them, which meant more rigging, <laughs> which like the giant, that's the kind of the trick thing whenever we go into a space is how are we going to rig the giant and how are we going to rig the silk? Mm -hmm. And this needs to be suspend it, it here in the Studebaker Theater, it's operated um, by, it connects into the, the there's uh, boxes in that beautiful theater and then the upper mm -hmm. boxes, um, stagehands have lines and pull the lines up for the silk to be suspended. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you said the word pulley. Yes. Because in the first panel, I gave a pop <laughs> quiz on the six simple machines, <laughs> and that's one of them. <laughs> Pulleys. Yes. <coughs> so um, is this a projection onto the silk, or is it printed on there? No, it's a projection. So we have, um, there's an, there are sort of super titles, um, uh, as well as the, the the singers are singing in Chinese and also a, a, an ancient Chinese and also a sort of made up language. Um, so the, the, the story, the kind of a, a, a very light, um, you know, explaining what's going on is projected um, as well as the entire Chinese libretto is projected. And I, we end up using the, um, I mean I use, it end up becoming more than just Super titles, it sort of became an element of projection design and using it mm -hmm. as a, a visual. Most audiences that we've shown the show to, I, I can't read the Chinese symbols. So I, to me, it just looks like it was a design. sort of a design element. And the show has, is, has, is, is extremely elastic in its uh, approach to time, <laughs> I'll say. So there are long passages. and. Having, being able to project something else was a great benefit to me as a designer. It was interesting when we went to China and did the show and people could read what we were projecting and I had to, um, I had to change it in okay. a way because I was um, projecting it too fast or projecting it at the wrong time. So, mm -hmm. um, so we've had, it's just funny how this show has changed mm -hmm. and demanded how it needed to be mm -hmm. along the way. And that links back to, um, I love how the panels kind of coalesce. So yesterday we had Dr. Claudia Orenstein talking about her, her book, Reading the Puppet Stage. And she showed us a diagram um, where she's outlining the relationship of sort of three-dimensional figures that we recognize as puppetry and then visual design um, flat forms like illustration, like animation and what is the relationship between those things. And so your uh, mm. screen here with the Chinese that works one way for an audience that can read it and another way for audiences that can't is um, a good example. So I'll bring that up to Dr. Orenstein. Great. <laughs> okay, let's move on. <laughs> and this is, the, this is the scene of the water above the water so the scene just before was under the water. And the story that's told there is the story of, um, of there was a princess who was swimming in the sea and, um, and she, was, um, she, she refused the advances of the dragon king under the, in the undersea kingdom. And so she was transformed into a bird. And then she spends the rest of her life um, trying to fill the ocean with sticks and twigs um, for revenge. And, and it's sort of a, a, a her endless driving impossible uh, mission to mm -hmm. fill the ocean with, with sticks and twigs. Um, and so uh, that, that story, of course, used primarily um, the, the, uh, the silk, and, uh, and that the, the figure that you see on the pole represents the bird. Um, and, uh, you know, and we'll also, we'll say in English, there was a bird. <laughs> 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 to be clear, I, I, I liked using these more abstract shapes. Um, and then there's a similar shape that's used under the water. That's uh, <coughs> a, a sort of a fan with silk on it that's beautifully um, manipulated by uh, one of my puppeteers, Rosa Douglas. 
Um, and, uh, and so we, go, we tell the story both under the water mm -hmm. and above the water. And, um, and then under the water, the, the dragon king is represented with a sort of assemblage of the same driftwood that is used for the other figures. Mm -hmm. Now, is this the sun lantern? This is uh, one of the sun lanterns. So that's the, um, the uh, third piece, um, which is uh, the suns appear throughout. So I really tried to find ways to include these elements, the silk, the paper lanterns, and then the, the cardboard that had started as drift, uh, the driftwood that had started as cardboard um, in the workshops in each of the stories, just so that those things were used, we, you could see them e all being used. In the, um, in the third movement, we, that's really where we lean into the paper lanterns because they are the 10 suns that um, 10, s the story uh, is that there were 10 suns that would all um, live together in a tree and they would take turns coming out um, to, uh, to r represent the day and then come back to the tree and they would come out one at a time. But one day they all came out um, and, and it was catastrophic because it, the, the lakes dried up and the crops died and uh, people were at risk. And, um, and so there's a hero who came and shot down nine of the sons, an archer, um, uh, and, there's, and, and hence there's one son that remains. This was a very interesting section that we were doing with the, with, the, uh, with the singers because it was early on in that first workshop. I, I thought I always like to, because you can with puppetry, you can get, you don't have to be stuck on the ground. And however you can get up higher is, uh, is wonderful. And, um, and so let's put these lanterns on poles um, and it creates a more, vi you know, a, a vertical image, and the composer saw that, saw us working that way, and loved it, and that informed the the piece that he wrote, which ended up being ex rather long. It's really in incredibly m meditative, but uh, uh, unusually, like I, I, it was unusual for me to work mm -hmm. on something in a piece of music like that. And he said, no, I loved, loved, loved the, the suns on the poles. I loved them so much. I wanted more. I want to make the piece <laughs> longer. So it was really an amazing experience for me to work with a, a okay. living composer who was responding to <laughs> me um, and what I was doing. So things get longer and heavier. <laughs> they do, <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, this is the, um, uh, one of the first, uh, in the first section, which is the section about um, uh, the creation of the world, so sort of we, where we start kind of setting up the, the kind of rules of this world. Um, and it begins with a face, there's a, f a, f a face figure, which I'm sure there's a picture of as well. Um, uh, there's the face, so that's Pangu, um, the, 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 the giant who sort of the world was created from his body. So his, um, as described in the Book of Mountains and Seas, um, when he when he died, then um, his uh, his uh, his teeth became mountains. The um, his blood became the rivers. Um, his eyes became the sun and the moon. And um, we do exactly that in the show. As we start with this face, we present this face, and then on stage, we disassemble him and reassemble him to create the mountains and the seas, and the sun and the moon, which <coughs> is in the, in the previous image. Oh, that's, so yeah, that's, that's all the images. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. that's, that's, that's Book of Mountains and Seas, mm -hmm. uh, this, yeah. this show that's part of the festival. OK. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you. OK, so I need to get into my email um, because we sprung this on Yael Rasuli at the last minute. Privileged and, and honored, and, yes. And so she has been able to send me images and things at the penultimate moment. <laughs> Just now. And I know the message is there, but I didn't have this tab open. There it is. Okay. So. 
first, I will. I, I pulled the bio from your website, so. <laughs> So, born in 1983 in Jerusalem, Israel, Yael was trained primarily as a classical singer and went to study theater design in London. She began developing her unique theatrical language at the School of Visual Theater in Jerusalem, where she specialized in directing puppetry and design and graduated with excellence. Since 2006, Yael has been creating independent theater works and performs at leading international festivals throughout Europe, the United States, particularly this one, the Chicago International Puppet Theater Festival, South America, and the Far East. Yael's theatrical language is based on a multidisciplinary approach combining different forms of theater, puppetry, visual art, and music. So we're going to see that approach today. Welcome, please, Yael Thank Rasuli. Thank you. Hi, everyone. And once again, I'll start with the okay. same question. What did the puppet need to do? And tell me which of these to open uh, so we can, can see open, the puppet. Uh, first of all, the last one. OK, that's this. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can do like the slideshow. OK, great. Beautiful, you are prepared. <laughs> <laughs> I just sent it. So um, I think we're going to get, oh, great. Yeah, um, I'm going to like take you quickly through my artwork. But if we're speaking about like the puppet and the puppet, um, you know, and the technique and what we're looking for, um, then I can say that um, for me, it really depends on the individual project, um, unlike uh, some, some people and some puppeteers here that really like have kind of their developed aesthetic and manipulation language and then they go like deep into that and you know expand that. Uh, then for me it's really been, um, okay, what is this show about? What does it need? Or kind of chance encounters and a lot has been based on limitations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, for years where, um, well, I don't have like a studio where I can make things. Uh, and when I graduated from the School of Visual Theater in Jerusalem, I didn't have, you know, waitressing and didn't have uh, a studio. And so I thought, uh, paper, <laughs> it's easy to travel with, and I can cut it in my apartment. And uh, uh, for example, or I would discover an object and be like, ah, this, I don't know what it is, but you know. <laughs> um, or I would see a show, like I saw Chaika um, some years ago in Chaleville, and it just, um, blew me away and I thought, oh, why not? Um, so for me, it's kind of, it's also like about the metamorphosis and like discovery and what the individual show needs. And it's a big headache, <laughs> let me tell you, because uh, you kind of you have to inv invent the wheel every time. And, uh, but it's just the way that I work. So um, if you can just keep like okay. some images. Well, this is my family. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's all about the family. And um, yeah, just to say, uh, I, oh, wait, just stop on this. I grew up between Jerusalem and, uh, and Toronto and then Seattle. So uh, I kind of got exposed there and I, and I moved between like 10 schools in 12 years, moved around a lot and had to like inv reinvent myself everywhere. And also uh, this kind of, um, S clash schizophrenia that I definitely experience even more so uh, today um, between like living in, in, in a country in war, perpetual war, and um, very violent and yeah, you know, many, many things that have to do with Israel. And then seeing another kind of life, Toronto, it's kind of the most extreme <laughs> from <laughs> Jerusalem and, uh, and Seattle and, and having to like hold these two worlds languages, perspectives inside, and, um, and, and also it really, like I think one of the elements of my career has been like that I wanted to get as far away as possible from the place I come from, <laughs> which is Jerusalem. So that's been like a main propeller and still is, um, I have to say, you know, but we can only run away uh, far and, you know, it's always uh, you carry it with you. Um, and uh, 
but I definitely wanted to, um, like puppetry was something I actually discovered where, um, uh, where Basel studied at, in charleville mezieres at the World International Puppetry Festival. And, uh, you know, as you heard before, I was a classical singer and I wanted to do acting and this, but I couldn't find myself in anything and I hated auditioning. And, and puppetry kind of said, oh, I can write my own rules. Uh, also as a woman creator, and uh, you know, I don't have to sit and wait by the phone. I'll invent my own show, my own character, um, and I will be able to build the team with the artists that inspire me, and I won't have to choose between the different art forms. I won't have to choose between design and, and, uh, and stage and music, and I can incorporate everything, because that's what puppetry is at its basis. And I really ended up in a crazy, special way in charleville mezieres Next festival is September 25. Write it down and go there. It will change your life. <laughs> Start saving and book your Airbnb as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just saw for 10 days, when I was 20, uh, like every day I saw maybe five, seven, eight shows a day of some of the biggest artists in the field. And also little shows in pubs, Romeo and Juliet with tomatoes and cucumbers, you know, just <laughs> like, and I thought, ah, I can have my own show and I can put it into a suitcase and I can travel the world. And so I had this image and I went back to Jerusalem and studied there. Um, you can keep going. And then I made paper cut when I came out of school which is, the, I've been performing in over 30 countries now. Um, and, uh, and, you know, uh, you can just keep uh, showing some images. So, you know, I was, this is the, the paper. I tried to develop a language of cinema in low tech. Um, and, uh, and then, like, so I'm just showing you, like, very, very different, extremely different ways of design. This is the House by the Lake, a show that we're hoping to bring to Chicago. Uh, three sisters in hiding during the Holocaust, and uh, and again, like this show was inspired by like dolls that children um, can keep that going on, yeah, that dolls that children had in hiding, uh, children that mm -hmm. were Holocaust survivors that we met and told us about the objects and toys that saved them f in years of hiding and. Um, and um, so this is a show that's been touring for 14 years. I either make a show that tours for 14 years or that plays three times. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so this show we really thought like each sister, three sisters, and each one will have like a puppet that is her double, uh, her doll, and as the time goes by and the situation worsens, they turn into the dolls themselves also as they um, escape into a world of imagination um, to keep surviving. Um, and uh, so I think a lot of my work is based on trauma. And like for me, creating is about survival. Um, and like survival, like in my life and the things I want, and you know, it's like enabled me. Uh, this touring life I've been doing for almost 20 years now has enabled me, first of all, just to meet incredible people around the world and collaborate with wonderful artists. And um, yeah, I can keep skipping. So this is like the house by the lake. You can go a little faster on it. This is, um, and then, um, and with this show, Bon Voyage and Other Lies, I collaborated with an Israeli very famous author, Edgar Keret. And there I, I was like, okay, I'm gonna develop like the language of paper theater even more, so what if it's like, like in this show, for example, you can just keep, uh, I thought it's like, this is how, um, you know, this language of paper theater enabled me to be, to play like a, a character of a woman, of a man, of, uh, of a baby, like very fast uh, transitions. So, you know, each project is really like, uh, that's me, blonde, finally. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was all happening on, on a plane um, heading towards disaster and kind of uh, different stories and uh, identities. <coughs> um, Shelley, what a character. This was like really an animation film uh, in live on coke. It was, was really like the, uh, finally we discovered, we, we tried to develop so many techniques of like 
invented these hats to put this paper on to this. Finally, we taped two magnets on our forehead <laughs> and we had like 30 masks that were just like, and also, you know, you couldn't, couldn't turn or anything. If you had to go off stage, you had to just like pray and go right and reach out your hand. Someone had to grab you. <laughs> um, yes, um, this is the twins, a story of two twin sisters who fall in love with two twin brothers. <laughs> And uh, it ends, of course, very badly in betrayal. <laughs> and uh, so we could develop further the language of pop-up. And this is me as the mother on the, the plane. And also, it's just, it was a crazy, crazy challenge to enter. It was also like a very masochist language because like, it worked perfectly if you had, but if you moved it like an inch, nothing worked. Like just, you know, if you want to invent traps for yourself. <laughs> um, but like, since this show, everything, else I do is like, so zen. <laughs> um, so that's a show that like years were put into it, played very little, <laughs> but because it also, like Basil said, it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and then I couldn't afford to tour it. <laughs> so that happens, and I think that shows also, you know, they have a fate of their own, and uh, this is uh, what I wanted to really focus on, which is uh, the trilogy, who knew it would be a trilogy, but it's a trilogy um, that I started when I was still a student, when I was 22, uh, which is about violence towards women and children and sexual violence and survival from that. And, um, and so this was my first ever show, How Lovely, um, that was me and this cello case that was like, when it was open, it was the two parents in the story mm. that send the little child off to her music lessons. And when the case was closed, it actually became the predator. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I made this show, and then I made this puppet, also not knowing what it was gonna be for. It's made out of broken musical instruments, viola, violin pieces. And, uh, and, and yeah, and I started touring it when I was a baby. <laughs> I was 23 years old. Uh, it was based on my own personal experience. And like through this work, I actually, this is long before me too, and it was actually how I found out that um, this is not only my story, and it resonated with so many people. People will come to me after the show and say, this is my story, and, like, and, and I knew that like, I have this privilege to be telling this story also through visual theater and, uh, and, and theater of images and music that we can get to talk about places in the soul that words are not enough. And, uh, and, and this was a 20 minute performance. I, w I just wanna put it out there that I'm a strong believer in short performances also. It's not easy to sell, so you can team up with your friends, but I always say, and I say to my students, like, you know, start with a 15 minute, 20 minute show. And, uh, um, and, and then I, I toured it for like 10 years at the same time that I was doing also other shows and much more, much lighter themed shows. And, um, and, uh, and I found that um, uh, it was like heartbreaking for the audience I felt really guilty performing it. <laughs> As people would come and they would start laughing, I'm this funny character and then suddenly, you know, rape and like shock and then the show ended with uh, the child, like th the vicious cycle continuing and you know, the lights faded out, you wanted to die, you know? And I thought, no, like now I'm, I was already like in my early 30s, I was like, I wanna talk about the next level. I wanna develop the aesthetic language of the show, but also like who does this child become, who th the woman that this child becomes to start talking about trauma and post-trauma and, uh, and, and the beginning of healing and reclaiming your voice. Um, and, uh, and this was back in 2017. And while I was actually working on this show, I went through another uh, attack, very s severe, um, in the middle of nowhere. And, um, um, and I actually kept going on this show, but had to put it aside. Uh, for several years uh, and, uh, and finally managed to complete it in 2021. Um, and this is Silence Makes Perfect. They'll be performing in France next year. Um, you can, so uh, it was kind of like we reworked the first part of the trilogy, <coughs> uh, but this time with a world famous classical pianist, a 
plays in Carnegie Hall, and I have this obsession about collaborating with classical musicians and getting them to do puppetry. <laughs> uh, beware, <laughs> warning. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I was extremely lucky because Amit turned out to be an incredible partner in helping me tell this story. And uh, um, so the puppet became, we entered more into like this mask subconscious world. Uh, this is kind of the technique we worked on that was actually 3D printed masks. We would scan the face of the performer. The designer, Ran Daniel Coppola, would um, create these um, and then we would print them and I would paint them. Um, and yeah, and I mean, it's, uh, it's extremely rewarding um, to be able to, you know, it, was, it took years, it took five years to put on this show um, and, um, and manage to get to that place I wanted to get to of reclaiming your voice um, and still to accept um, to be in darkness is that's where I still was at that point, you know, but but um, and like the odd and we always have audience discussions after the show. Sometimes I think I do the show for the audience discussions, and and uh, and to do the show like to tell you know people that see it um, that you know you're not alone. This is not uh, this is experienced by so many women and children, and men, um, and. Uh, Yes, you can see. Um, so really, every time um, I find, I discover a different language um, with my collaborators. And then I want to talk to you yes, um, about the last part of the trilogy um, that I've just uh, previewed in Norway, um, which is, oh, you can see some more masks here. <laughs> Uh, it started as a show called Burning Blue. I worked on it for three years, and then I censored it. Um, so the third part of the trilogy, uh, you can skip these, this is another bigger production <laughs> I made in Corsica, but it was also part, um, because when the third part of the trilogy, um, the third part of the trilogy is the experience that happened to me in 2017. Um, that's, that's great here. So um, that I was actually kidnapped on my ride home organized for me after a show. And I actually, and I managed to survive and save myself from this experience that lasted several hours. And I, I, it's a crazy story, but the reason I'm still here is that uh, I used everything I learned on stage um, at this moment of, uh, of survival in life. And I managed to also sing to save my life. And, uh, and the songs that I was singing, uh, at first it started like American swing jazz music, which is my repertoire. But very quickly I realized that I have to move to the French repertoire <laughs> and to the songs of Edith Piaf that really uh, helped me keep going. So in my experience also like art has saved me in the most physical sense. And then uh, I was offered an, uh, can go back one. I was offered an amazing opportunity to go to a tiny fisherman village in the north of Norway, uh, Stamsund. They also have an international puppetry festival. It's called Norland Visual Theater. Check it out. Uh, you can apply for residencies there. Um, and they allowed me to go there and, and develop this show. Uh, and it's taken, again, years. And uh, and part of the process of making this show, I also turned to actually Natasha and Tita, and we did a workshop together because I was looking for the language of it. And, uh, um, and finally I found it, you can, so I work, I, I guess I use shows to work with artists I love <laughs> <laughs> also. So this is Yaelin Bar, um, an amazing puppeteer um, from Israel. Um, just to show you some names and Google them. Um, kind of the foam puppets that she's worked with. If you know Duda Paiva's work, so Yael was one of his teachers and uh, an artist he worked with at the beginning of his career. Uh, Eduardo Felix, uh, he performed here in the festival a few times from Brazil, from Pygmalion. Mm -hmm. um, you can see some of Eduardo's amazing work. Mm -hmm. 
also very diverse in all he creates. Polina Borisova, I think maybe she also played here, an amazing, so I really just like invited people I love and that I admire to work with me and, uh, and, uh, and we worked on this show that was called Burning Blue. And then uh, and Neville Tranter, please Google, you can see a lot of Neville's work. He, Neville does Muppets. I never thought I would do Muppets in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, I, 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 I realized that for this show, I, and this is me and Edith already, this is prototype number three. <laughs> uh, I realized that I couldn't tell this show without Edith with me on stage to really um, to help me and to keep also a level of humor as I walked into the darkness. And um, so you can see us here together. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just training, I'm like I'm a student. I'm learning um, how to work with different prototypes, with different languages, with rhythms. Uh, Neville Tranter came and worked with me on this. And I wanna just show you the last things like the other lots of different. <laughs> This is, uh, um, I want to, oh, can you maybe open the, go back to the email? Mm -hmm. I just want to show you who she, and the three from the last. Three. Yeah, this one. And if you can just go down here, yeah, down, down, down. Yeah, like to this guy. Yeah, and open the slideshow. Thanks. And go back one. So this is actually a character I made. Oh, you can just skip quickly. Uh, that character I made in uh, Natasha's workshop. As I was looking, this guy. <laughs> as I was looking, so this is you know the language of Natasha with, and Tita with the collage, and and this is me. So and uh, I call this becoming your predator. Um, and uh, it, it never made the show. <laughs> It was cut, um, but I, I tried this aesthetic also for a while. It was too realistic and too real. Um, and, uh, but it was part, part of the process. And you can just, for the end, you can you uh, keep skipping, it? yeah, forward. This is the end of that. Ah, uh, that's the end? Uh. Well, um, and if you want to see what this developed into, come on Sunday. <laughs> uh, you'll be able to see uh, um, Edith, what she turned into. And also tonight, um, I might be showing a scene. I will be showing a scene at the cabaret. She's beautiful. Oh, she is really be beautiful. Maybe on this one. Um, but I really want to encourage people to try different techniques that you know nothing about. And, uh, and, you know, and also I want to encourage people to be like, okay, um, I'm a puppeteer. I'm an object theater maker, you know, just say it. And then, you know, and then do it. And, and, and if you find an artist that you love their language, then, you know, sink into that and see what works for you. And, um, and there are a million reasons not to create, you know, but like I want to encourage you al also to start small, and in your living room, if need be. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I'm really, really happy to be back here. I've been teaching here in Chicago the last two summers. Um, and, uh, and I love this festival so much. And I have to also say that thanks to this festival, I have a, a US working visa for the next three years. Yay. So uh, you'll be seeing much more of me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Yael. Thank you. Um, at this point, we can open the floor for questions. Please wait for Ana Diaz Liga <coughs> to bring the microphone to you, because we're live streaming and we want. Yes, there's a gentleman already in the back there. Okay. Hey, this is a question for Basil. Hi. Um, when you were in the workshop with the singers, and then, and they were working with the puppet, and then you went on that you know, and it progressed. I'm wondering, did that initial experience with the singers manipulating the puppet inform anything, either just the rhythm or 
their presence or the music around the puppet, or is that something that you had experienced before? Um, well, it uh, it's in, it was an interesting lesson in keeping it simple, you know, because they weren't trained puppeteers. So just really just like making a puppet walk, <laughs> you know, just like the very the very e e essential simple things, and um, and then that. You know that in, in informed what the f final piece is. The puppet also still just does very simple actions, um, and uh, anyway, was, but I think that came from you know the way it's a, amazing for me to go back and look at the videos that I made with those singers, um, and how much it's all there, um, and how much I tried to stay true to that even though then later I had the opportunity to make things out of something other than cardboard and to make and to work with you know skilled puppeteers still what was um, that essential uh, that essential element of like creating in the room with some people who were sort of novices to the craft um, is what stays in the show it's just refined but it's the same element. Okay, there's a question down front. Uh, this is for Basil. Uh, I'm really curious about the whole process uh, of creating with non-puppeteers. Mm -hmm. Did they actually help you? Did you say, okay, here's a cardboard, here's a silk, here's a, and have them, or what happened? How did you do that, one? Two, you mentioned video. Do you video each and every rehearsal and what you learn from it and then go back and play with it? What is that whole process like? So, the, so I had in the process, in the making process, I had some, I had one like a buddy who's a kind of a jack of all trades maker with me supporting. And I also had two local puppeteers because I thought, Oh yeah, I'll use singers, but the way we must have there have to be at least two hidden puppeteers making it look like <laughs> they're doing the work. So m the things like making a making the giant, uh, I actually I don't remember if the singers may have helped, but it was very sim it was like take this piece of cardboard, roll it into a tube, and put a piece of tape around it. That's a leg. <laughs> now here's another one. This is an arm. Now tape them together. Okay, so it was very, it was very simple. Um, and I, the singers may have been involved in that because it was that simple. Um, uh, and, but the, the essential kind of, you know, making of, okay, let's, let's now make this um, face, turn this face into some mountains. And I had just made some jagged cardboard cutouts and they they did that work I do I there I'm glad that somebody filmed it actually <laughs> I don't always you know I'm not always on it with documentation so for me generally if something uh, sticks if something is right it sticks in my mind I actually I know I was prompted Blair said do you have drawings or um, sketches that we can share or we're wanting to do a, an exhibit of and I don't I don't know where my drawings are it's mostly <laughs> that I'll work it out in the room and if something <coughs> s sticks you know it and then if you have to do it again you'll make it again out of cardboard so um, but I'm but I, I'm, I'm I do use video frequently as a tool to film and I I, I got an iPad mostly so that I could film things and show them back to people on the spot yeah. um, uh, because it's, it's the best tool for people to be able to see what they're doing. Um, and, then I, and then I have all those videos still. Okay. Thank you. Took way oh, here and then we'll, we won't forget you there in the back. We'll get you next. I, I, was, uh, I was really interested in the uh, Ten Moons hmm. and how the p the composer made the piece longer. Yeah. So um, 
you know, when I watch puppetry, it's so interesting all the subtle ways the puppets can move, but did you find you were stuck with like repeating a lot of the same motions with the, or was that hard to extend it? Or how did you work that out? Because that mean, seems it's really I hard. Am, <laughs> my other shows of mine, I tend to be like, I need a different, I have sort of ADD and I need something to change every three seconds and there <laughs> needs to be tons and tons and tons of puppets and objects and things and, um, and this was not that show. So I, and a, and a, <laughs> a lantern on a stick only has so many moves yeah. you can do. <laughs> so you, I just really had to lean into the music, you know? I mean, it was an experience of really leaning into the music, being with the music, letting it be about the music, that it's about the music, that it's a, it's a, it's an extraordinary piece of music, it's a ex group of extraordinary singers, and there's also some beautiful visuals that are accompanying it, is kind of the, the spirit I had to approach with it. <laughs> and I, you know, and uh, I mean, I, w I, I was, w he, the, the, the piece of music with the 10 sons, it's, it's a very long piece, it's very slow, and I, mm. I wasn't sure, how can I do this? This is not my style. But when he assured me, no, I wrote it because I loved what I saw. Mm -hmm. I loved what I saw, and I, that inspired me as a composer. I had to just go with that and trust that because I was working with this, that he was my collaborator. And now I, th th that piece of music is, when you get to the end of it, it's, a, it's pretty extraordinary to have sat with that and, 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 and there is some, you know, we change the lights, the colors change within the lanterns, and we found ways for variety, but it is very, it's very spare, and it's very simple, and it's, there's a, it's a, ex it's a very extraordinary um, collaboration with that composer and those singers. Okay, thank you. Then back here, yes. Thank you all. For is this working? Okay, I think so. Thank you all for sharing about your work. My question is for Yael. I'm curious sort of how you came to the idea of having the cello case as a character in the first show in your trilogy and also sort of what it was like working with a character that sort of embodied both the parents and the attacker. Um, I would just love to hear a little bit more about that process and that character if you're comfortable sharing. Thank you. Well, I think, uh, you know, sometimes I think that all we can do is show up for the work and then uh, be uh, receptive to the miracles of discovery. That that's really our only responsibility, you know, like, and uh, um, um, like to show up and then be receptive. And so uh, that was, an, yeah, I, I had a friend who's a violin maker and uh, he said, well, I'm throwing away a bunch of stuff, come, you know, and I, and I took like a lot of stuff and then I, I played around. Like the space of, of playing, which is really like, it's very child place, you know? Like I think the whole work is to move the critic out of the room and, uh, and, and this is why I love working with music in improvisation. Like I would go into a space and put some music and if I remembered documentation, the camera, <laughs> so I remember what I did later and look at it with love, <laughs> we try. And, uh, and, and you know, it was, it was just, it came out of this moment where I agreed to be a child and play with the object. And actually at first I made like a little skit for these two characters. They were like actually like a couple that were, uh, like we're late for a movie and the woman told the guy that she was pregnant and it all happened in a cinema and this like it was something completely different and then it suddenly uh, when I agreed to look inside and 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 um, uh, and agree to go into my pain then it it came in this way and I think that um, um, uh, the fact that you can uh, the fact that you can use one object to become so many things and to metamorphosize and, you know, like Basil was saying, uh, this less is more element. Um, and when I think about it today, I think that, you know, violence is also 
like you know a traumatic experience is something that has so much resonance on so many circles um, you know what happened is not just um, um, my own um, pain but also the pain of my family and my parents who experienced this and 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 also how everything was you know linked and intertwined in um, so I think uh, and Yes, this um, this possibility of metamorphosis from so few elements, you know, and I think that's a wonderful um, exercise. A wonderful exercise I would really propose when you're discovering a puppet or an object, you know, is to go into space and put music on, maybe different kinds of music, and just improvise very freely and see what happens. And with text, without text, just. You know, like you could get more done in 20 minutes of this than you can for weeks when you're like, mm, let's try it like this, let's try it like this, you know? So to get to that intuitive place of discovery and then appreciating what you discovered. Okay, it's ping-ponging from the back to the front again. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. So sort of, I wanted to talk a little bit about my experience of this panel. Right, so I sort of <laughs> came into it thinking about when you think about the production, right, and the product, and whose vision is it that you are um, uh, that you're you're executing against, right? Is it the the, the puppet? Uh, is the is the vision the puppeteer the vision? Is it the, the 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 design or is it the music is the vision and then the the puppet is the the um, sort of how it gets executed. But really what I'm hearing in all of this is the co-creation. And that's sort of what I'm taking away from it is that, and the co-creation could be the music, the music. It could be the trauma. It could be the medium, right? But it's all about the, that's the co-creation concept, right? And that's what I'm hearing that, that moved me in this, in this panel. So I want to thank you very much because it sort of, sort of took me to a different place then I started, and that's really what I would think that you'd want anyone to come out of from a panel, right? You know, you started here, but when it ended, you're, you're at a different place, and so thank you very much. And thank yes. you. And thank you, sir. Um, in the theory of puppet performance, we have gone deep into the relationship between the puppeteer's human consciousness and the negotiation that happens with the material. So that idea of collaboration is central to what we think we're doing with the puppet. Thank you. Okay, there was a question over there, and then we'll come back to you. <coughs> uh, this is another question for Yael. In the realm of discovery that we're talking about, and also with sort of appreciation for your uh, urging of short form content, 15, 20 minute pieces, I was curious about your sort of journey in the, the shorter pieces of the, both development and in performance of those pieces like how do you find how have you found like effective impactful stories to sh to share in like a shorter time and then how do you how have you kind of gone about presenting those you're not going to like book the studebaker and be like 20 minutes be like all right thanks guys but sort <laughs> of like how what has sort of your journey been in creating and sharing those kind of like quicker shorter pieces and ways you found like success through it f success like fulfillment through those kind of works Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks for this wonderful question. Um, so, like one possibility, for example, because I, I, I feel like sometimes we only have materials for 15, 20 minutes, but then we make an hour show. Like we, we, we know, we all know this feeling. Um, and uh, and um, and I, I think like one, one way is really to, um, to make your 15, 20 minute show and then collaborate with other people who have their own 15, 20 minute show. And, 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 and that's what I did starting off, even with How Lovely with this show. I teamed up with two other performers. And it's amazing, like when you look for things, threads in common, you will find them. And then we let the, the work simmer a little bit into each other. And, and we had, we, you know, but we put this night together and then we also made like a scene together to wrap it up. But, but there we had it. And, uh, and, and uh, for, for one example. But when it's like my own show, 
I, I always think, like, I like working in stages. I can't handle the one big deadline at the end. It's too paralyzing. So I will always, like, make a, sh you know, I will, I will break down the process and I will show 15, 20 minutes to my friends sometimes, you know, in someone's living room or in a little theater and I will just force myself to have little deadlines and I really look at the show like, like, I look at the show like, okay, it has to be, there have to be like maybe 12 scenes that each one has to be like wow of its own, you know, or, or maybe seven or eight, yes? And so I really try to, to look at it also like that, like almost as cabaret numbers in a show. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then a lot of it is, you know, letting things simmer and, and revisiting them. But um, yes, like forcing yourself, just saying, okay, a month from now, I am going to invite these 10 friends and I'm gonna show them work. And you give yourself like that deadline and you can invite other people to also show their work, but you know I think that um, it's a really necessary way forward. And then you know, and then comes the wonderful era where you have to what is it like, like kill your angels, babies, sweethearts. I don't <laughs> know <laughs> when you have like too much material, you know. So I think uh, um, as uh, some of you know, the book of the Artist Way. It's very inspiring to me. I highly recommend it. And, uh, and the author says, uh, like, we're responsible for the quantity. You know, like, then trust the universe for the quality, you know, but, like, just make, uh, make material, you know, like, like painters here in their studios, so many sketches. Um, just whatever you need to do to go out of your head and make stuff and then show it. As, as much as possible in the stages. This is what I, I need for my process. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So back over here. And then <coughs> the ping pong back. Yeah, one blue shirt here, and then the next one will be another blue shirt back there. Is it me? Yes, you. <laughs> um, hello, all. Um, thank you so much for being here and speaking. Um, I, I have a question for anyone who is inclined to take it. Um, but it's really about the relationship between you and your creations and your art. Um, I know as artists, all of the things that we make are going to have little fragments of us in them, even if it's not intentionally put there. Um, and so I wonder, as performers, um, how you feel, how your relationship is with your puppets, with your creations, and how that may change if you're the one performing with it and separating this as maybe a different character or watching somebody else perform with your work and releasing the parts of yourself to let them add, add by performing with them, um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Would you all like to take that, Natasha and, and Tita? They're still explaining. <laughs> the translation's coming. material en el escenario, Natasha mira desde fuera, hacemos un recording, camera. So she does things on stage and Natasha is watching and they're recording. Y luego juntas eh, vemos donde ella se identifica, donde yo me identifico y donde encontramos un sentido eh, juntas. So then they watch the recording and they try to figure out where she, where Natasha sees her, herself, where Tita sees herself, and where they can find like that they are both seeing themselves. Y hacemos funcionar eh, muy activamente nuestra intuición durante todo el proceso de creación. During the whole creative process, they're really actively making their intuition work. Uh, y como decía Yael, eh, hacemos mucho, 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 mucho material. Like Yael was saying, they generate a lot of material. Sí. Pero antes, eh, discutimos mucho y reflexionamos mucho sobre el texto. Nos basamos en un texto. Entonces hay una obra 
un ancla, un lugar donde ir siempre cuando tenemos dudas, ir a, a, a consultar. Uh, since they work based on playtext, they actually begin their process by discussing a lot before generating a lot of material, and then this text becomes their anchor that they can go back to whenever they have questions. Y uh, alguna vez también la obra, cuando se termina, si sí, entiendo bien su pregunta, cuando se termina nos permite uh, entender cuál es la relación interna nosotros teníamos con esta obra. Por ejemplo, bueno. So sometimes actually at the end of the process, watching the, the show that they made, they can actually understand the relationship that they had with that text. For example, uh, for, uh, for example, la plus uh, concrète avec le Chaika que vous avez vu ici. Au début, on ne savait pas pourquoi on a choisi raconter cette œuvre à partir d'Arcadia, une, une actrice uh, vieille qui n'est pas un personnage central. So, for example, uh, Chaika is a very concrete example where, when they started working with it, they didn't know why they had chosen to show the story from the perspective of Arcadia, who is not a main character in the text. Y se a la fin con a écrit de ya el text por nuestros flyers, on se di, me en fait, on es todos los dos perdu nuestra mère trop tôt, y on avait besoin de una mère plus vieille, on n'a jamais connu nuestra mère vieille, y on a dedié la obra a nuestra mamá. So when they started writing the text to present the show, um, they realized that both of them had lost their mothers really young. So they had this kind of like need to meet their mothers when they were old because they never got a chance to interact with their mothers as old, older Mais women. On a à ça avant. But they didn't think about that when they had started creating the show. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. So we're down to the last two minutes. And so I wanted to give the gentleman in the blue shirt back there the opportunity to ask the last question. Um, and of course, <coughs> you might catch up with people afterwards, but our live stream is in a certain time slot, so we end on time. <laughs> so as a young artist who spends a lot of time with many other young artists, I've often found that a big part of the work we do in making our art is not just the art itself, but making the ends meet so that we can do the art. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you folks could comment a little bit on how you've been able to make your passion your career and put food on the table while also doing the things that you love. Can I? Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. I love this question. Um, yes, I... I you know, we were t talking about limitations before that, and um, well, I uh, well, I'll put it like this: like I find that like my biggest job <laughs> in my art, and which is the same as in my life, is to be my best friend and supporter. And uh, and and my lifelong lesson is also learning to put myself in priority, even before the work. And, oh, shocking, I know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And also the, the well-being of my team members. Uh, that's been really, uh, I really had to learn that, you know, and because it really changes all the dynamics in the room when people know that, first of all, you've got their backs and that you, in that you are understanding, you know, that we're all fragile in our different ways and we all go through the process. And, um, and of course, it's like sometimes easier to do it with other people and then doing it with yourself. But for me, it's been like, what do I need to be able to create, like really? And some of these things are like, you know, I, how, what I need, li like the basics, sleep, eat, um, and have like a safe environment to work in. And, uh, you know, I think if we all list all the reasons we have for not creating, we can buy many notebooks. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, and I think it's like um, um, a, a lot of it is connecting to, like daring to connect to your inner passion and make like, inner st like your stories and, uh, and not be confused by like, you know, falling into other projects that may be nice and uh, like, you know, understanding when your 
operating from your mind like, oh, it's going to be very advantageous for me to work with this person on their creation, la la la, all this reasoning, you know, and when it's like, no, this is what I want, even if it's going to take me seven years, like this is, this is what's really burning inside me. And, and to find that kind of, because once you tap into that well, then it's really, um, it will take you on the right journey. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm sure that our other panelists have a wealth of wisdom on that topic, and maybe you can catch them before they leave the room. But Persistence pays off. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. But unfortunately, we're at 12.02. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank our wonderful panelists for all of their insights.